Hi, and welcome everybody to our 31st Open Clock Club. And um, big uh, hello wherever you are around the world. Oh, we've got a message already. Oh, it's disappeared. Good. Um, <laughs> and my name's Matthew Reed, and uh, this is a weekly event that we hold to support people primarily who are beginning their clock repair journey. Um, we focused particularly last week, we had a 90 minute special and thank you to those uh, regulars who supported us in that um, to encourage people to get off the starting line because it can be quite intimidating. Uh, this week, uh, if there's something in particular I said I would do, uh, please remind me in the live chat uh, because uh, the weeks are pretty frantic at the moment and uh, here we are already on Saturday afternoon. So as is uh, traditional here, please say hello in the live chat. We've got Team Open Clock Club in the corner there who um, is uh, dealing with that. So lovely to hear from you all. And um, a bit of housekeeping. Remember that these sessions are recorded and they go on YouTube on our archive channel. So if you want to remain anonymous, then please keep your camera turned off. Um, so uh, many things, uh, many things have happened during the week. Uh, one of them was uh, our live stream on Thursday. We run a, a sort of a, it's a, a medium term project working through, I wouldn't say restoring, I wouldn't say overhauling, it's more sort of, um, it's more of a discussion than that, really. A uh, late 18th, early 19th century European long case clock or tall case clock movement. And a uh, little bit of a crazy session on Thursday, but we actually got the clock, or at least the going train anyway, ticking. So we've gone through the going train, repivoted, refinished, uh, refaced one of the pallets. Um, but I'm really pleased because we've managed to do it with minimal cleaning so far. Um, no pivot polishing and um, no bushing either. So really happy with all that kind of stuff. And it seemed to run fine. Uh, so back to the striking train next week. And we'll be doing a bit more silver soldering. So if you want to join us for that Thursday at um, 1800 British summertime. Oh, I've got my list here. Oh, um, so our Facebook group goes from um, strength to strength which is really crazy. We're 620 members or something now. And again, we seem, see people popping up from all over the world. So really happy to see you. Um, a big uh, thank you, shout out to the regulars uh, who seem to be there night and day, which is uh, really appreciated. And um, Jonas today, so thank you um, Jonas for posting a video about punching, using a tool to punch um, holes in the ends of mainsprings, which is really useful. I didn't, I don't use that technique myself. So it's really great when you can step in. And I think about the Facebook group, what's really important, it's lovely to see you, but when you're working through your projects, if you can just kind of build in five minutes or something, I know it takes a long time to do these things, just to take a couple of snaps of work in progress, because that way we can all learn. So Big thumbs up to Jonas for making that video. That was really appreciated. Um, what else happened? So yeah, just a little wrap up on last week's York Festival of Ideas. If we have anybody who joined us then and wants to hear more stuff for beginners following on from last week, then please ask in the live chat and we can try and accommodate uh, you. Delighted to do that. Um, we, uh, as many of you know, we've been working on a pre-publication for depthing and bushing. When we wrote our first book, which is uh, up there in Berry Lights, um, people sort of got through that very quickly, which I see as being encouraging. And they kind of said, uh, what next? And when I think you get involved in horological fora and the wider horological world, there's probably a lot of sort of almost uh, peer pressure really to do things like pivot polishing and depthing and bushing and so on. Um, so we'd already written some chapters, I drafted them, so we decided to uh, let them out, let them have their own life as uh, pre-production. So they're out now, you can get them on Kindle, um, you don't need a Kindle reading device for that, you can look at them on your computer or on your phone. 
and uh, they will eventually be part of a published hard copy book, but that's somewhere down the line. So adapting and bushing uh, is out. What else have we got? Um, right, okay, just something else that, um, I don't think I've lost it now, here it is. Something else that cropped up during the week was, uh, I think it was Simon asked about making, um, how do you make square uh, squares in horology? And of course, for the kind of 19th century, 18th century sort of work, uh, those squares, I'm not talking specifically about this exercise, were formed by hand. And so um, I, I kind of got a bit inspired to uh, do a bit of filing. So I made a, filed up a bit of square and then fitted it into a bit of scrap uh, plate here. Um, but that's not why I wanted to talk about it. What I wanted to talk about was new making. And, you know, we, we get a lot of people, understandably, uh, clocks people tend to be creatives by nature. That goes with the territory. And what I would always say is that, you know, working on historic uh, clocks is great. It's great fun, but you kind of get a bit frustrated. Well, it, from my perspective, obviously, I try and be quite conservative. So, um, you know, one way to get rid of that frustration is to make your own new clock. So that's some way off. But if you've got any thoughts about what you'd like to see there in terms of a program, and it will probably be a formalized kind of paid for program, please let us know. Um, and uh, yeah, so back to where we were a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about gearing and um, uh, we sent you some homework, which was about primarily about uh, these two gears here. So this is um, a great wheel from a European 30 hour duration uh, tall case clock. And you can see that this wheel has got actually multiple functions. It's really cool. Just get my pointy stick. It's, uh, it's really cool because it's got, um, these clocks are weight driven. Um, and you can see here, it's got a pulley with spikes in the middle where a rope goes round. Some of them are chain. In fact, this one um, has been running on chain. You can see there, See that little bit of glinting brass down in the bottom? So maybe it's been converted or maybe it's always been chained. Anyway, some are rope and some are chain. And one question we get is about knotting the rope or splicing clock rope on these things. Now, my former student, Dale, who you saw quite a few months ago now, has written a, a paper on it. And I'm trying to get him to publish that paper. So Dale, if you're watching this, then we'd be interested to know how you're getting on with that. And maybe we can twist his arm to come and give us a demonstration. I do have um, a way of doing it, but it's not particularly subtle. So uh, it's a weight driven clock. And so this is a great wheel. This is the first wheel in the train. And you can see driven into the periphery of the wheel are 13 pins and they lift the uh, hammer for the striking work. And um, which is all cool. This wheel, um, this mobile, should I say, which is a kind of generic term for a wheel and a pinion and an arbor together, meshes via this wheel here or this pinion uh, with another wheel. And what the homework was about is why when there are uh, 13 pins and 78 striking stations here, so one plus two plus three plus four equals 78. So it's got a ratio of 13 to 78. Why have they made 12 teeth and uh, 72 teeth on this one? So why have they changed the ratio? And some really cool answers came out of that. And uh, one kind of common theme was something called hunting gearing, which this isn't. But I think in industry, it's used a lot where you try and minimize the number of times or the frequency that one tooth engages with one pinion leaf to, to cut down wear and also to sort of even up uh, damage if there is any damage. That isn't the case here, but I think the, it's an interesting thing to bear in mind. And uh, it might be the case on the Enfield striking train, but I think Fyodor Vandenbroek came up with the right answer on this. I don't know if there's a right answer or not, of course. And that is that um, these uh, pinions here which are called the pinion of report, 
Don't know why it's called report, R-E-P-O-R-T. Could be because it um, communicates with this uh, count wheel, or it could be that it's to do with striking, like the report of a gun, you know, the sort of striking sound. I don't know. Again, um, I'm sure somebody will have some uh, answers there. But Fyodor said, well, Matthew, I think it's because this has got a square on it. You can see there. And, oh, there's in fact a good demonstration look of a square for Simon. Um, and if this has got 13 leaves on it, it can only go one way when you reassemble the clock. Whereas in theory, if it's got 12 on it, then it doesn't matter where you put that. It's always going to be synchronized with uh, the, uh, the count wheel, which is really important. So maybe that's it, but again, a little bit of um, conjecture there. And I think the, uh, my kind of summary of thought of this is when, again, when you begin in uh, clock repair or you get something that's a bit unusual, then do a train count. We show you how to do a train count in our book. And it's basically um, all the wheat, number of uh, teeth on the wheels and then the number of leaves on the pinion. And you just count them up with a pointy stick or a pencil or something and uh, write them down. In fact, Mark, if, I don't know if Mark's there tonight, but uh, thank you, Mark. You, Mark, sent an Excel spreadsheet for the Facebook group, which is really useful. And I think Mark said that he counts every, every clock he's ever repaired, which is brilliant because um, inevitably you will need that information one day when you get a clock that hasn't got a wheel or a wheel's damaged or broken or has been replaced or something. So very happy to come back to uh, train counts on striking trains and things. But I thought after last week's uh, session for beginners, where we looked at our single train Enfield clock, um, I might try and answer the question tonight about uh, sort of progression. Where do I go from there, Matthew? So I've decided to get into clock repair. I've gotten a clock with one train. It doesn't have to be an Enfield clock, but um, by one train, I mean just a timepiece. So uh, I've got our uh, cost per clocks. Probably never going to get put back in and reassembled again, but um, just whizzing around like that. So here's our single train movement. We've got a motive force here, a spring inside a barrel, which has got the first wheel on it, which is called the great wheel. And you've got one, two, three, four, uh, five wheels in our train. And uh, let's just pop that escape wheel back there. Back so. so this is pretty much about the simplest, using the term very, very um, advisedly, because there's no such thing as a simple mechanical clock. They can all really, really catch you out. Well, this is a brilliant place to begin for the beginner. Um, but what next? Where do you go next? Well, my advice, and it'd be interesting to hear what uh, you guys, you people think, um, would be then to progress to a similar mid 20th century mantle clock, uh, but with two trains. And there are all sorts of reasons uh, for that. One of the reasons um, that uh, we state for our single train Enfield clock is that if you really get into difficulty, there's a broken wheel or something missing, then the parts are pretty much interchangeable. So you can buy another donor movement and swap the parts over. Now, I wouldn't normally advise that for uh, you know all the clocks off when you're in practice, but certainly for the beginner, it's an incredibly useful uh, sort of fallback situation. So um, happened to buy on um, the internet this week. Uh, in, I don't know what the prices are like for these in the States or other countries or continents, but um, this uh, clock here, um, incredibly good value for money. I don't quite remember the price of it, but it was like less than ten pounds plus uh, postage. So unbelievable value for money. It's in really nice condition. Few paint splats uh, on there, which I really love. And um, presumably, it was bought in the middle of the twentieth century. Somebody kept it on their mantelpiece for twenty or thirty years. It got out of fashion. Went up in the loft. And um, and then somebody's put it on the on the internet. So 
you know, their loss is our gain. So this would be my second port of call for um, for the beginner. So if we just peek in the back, many of you will be familiar with this. Um, and uh, in fact, if you look at the uh, what we call the train, again, the gears, they're identical or pretty much identical in these clocks. So you've got the same uh, barrel here. You can see that it's what this one on this side under there. And um, we've got the intermediate wheel, center wheel, uh, escape wheel somewhere there and pallets. So basically half of this clock is exactly the same as the previous one. So for the beginner again, a really great confidence building exercise. And of course there are all sorts of German made clocks and American made clocks, but there are variations on this theme with their own challenges, which is a lot of the American clocks uh, have, haven't got um, a barrel per se, the spring is open, so it's a slightly different approach there. But nevertheless, you've got, um, the going train, which we've already dealt with, and then you've got the striking train. And as we talked about with our 30 hour clock uh, a couple of weeks ago, the big thing about the striking train, let's just get our 30 hour clock back, covered in spider's webs, um, is that uh, it's not the, you'll have de dealt with, um, you know, the concept of uh, gear trains and ratios and so on, and, bit of cleaning as is maybe needed here a few, few actual we've actually got actual spiders webs here which is really cool um but what you have when you come to reassemble the clock is a phase relationship issue if we just go back to our single train clock the the beginner clock doesn't matter where you put those wheels as long as they're in the right places of course but in relation to one another um, they don't have a specific phase relationship, whereas the really the single big challenge on striking clocks is that the relationship between the wheels uh, uh, in the striking train are fixed or pretty much fixed. So there's a little bit of extra learning to go on there. So I would say single train uh, Enfield type clock, two train Enfield type clock. Uh, and then maybe the three train, which people will know, I don't have one here, but as um, sort of Westminster striking, quarter striking mantle clock. And again, they're relatively inexpensive, at least in Europe, made in uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and have been incredibly out of fashion, but they're coming back into vogue now. So it's really nice to see. Um, now, we've had some really supportive uh, advice from our members this week on, um, on Facebook about problems or issues in repairing those three train clocks. Um, I don't know that much about them, so I might be tempted to say that uh, maybe isn't the best um, third clock. Put my gloves on because I'm going to be handling all sorts of um, mucky clocks in a minute uh so where next i mean that's you know if somebody comes to you or you are a beginner and you've gotten through these first two clocks where do you go next where's the next challenge and there's a few places um thank you to Vashish this week who asked a question about fusey uh driven um clocks and the replacement of springs which is a complete uh nightmare we're going to get onto it i'll pick up a couple of clock movements from the internet and maybe uh, two or three weeks time, we'll get getting around to that. Um, the answer is that keep the old spring if you possibly can is the easy answer. But there's all sorts of um, learning stuff there to do with fusees. I know, I don't know whether Jane's there uh, this week. Is Jane around? Uh, not seen Jane. So um, she worked on a fusee clock pretty early on in her clock repairing sort of career, as it were. Bit of a learning uh, curve there and all sorts of sort of health and safety. Uh, issues as well. Um, so that's one option um, for beginners. A few, when I say FUSE, that's F-U-S-E-E. -E. Um, what the FUSE is, is uh, a device for evening out the uh, delivery of power from the mainspring to ultimately to the escapement and oscillator. So um, it's something that's kind of not exclusive to uh, European or English clocks, but it tends to, that tends to be where you find uh, the, the fusee. So give us two or three weeks and we'll get round to the fusee clocks. So if you don't work on those, 
and you don't work on a three train clock, um, where else can you go? Just one of the things, as you'd mentioned, is we've got, um, I don't know whether Dell's there as well, but we've got a Torsion Dell on our Facebook page, who's a Torsion Pendulum Clock Specialist. Now, what a Torsion Pendulum Clock is, and again, we'll get one and we'll have a look at it, not my specialist field, but rather than the pendulum reciprocating and swinging backwards and forwards, it rotates about an axis and it's suspended on a very thin a wire, sometimes called anniversary clocks, sometimes called 400 day clocks. And um, so uh, torsion pendulum, fusey clock, uh, 30 hour clock, like we've just seen here. Again, you can pick the movements up, at least in Europe, they're not massively expensive. But what I'm building up to is a suggestion that kind of the second phase of your clock uh, repairing learning journey might be with French clocks. And again, I'm speaking from a bit of a European perspective because French clocks and they're are still like relatively, I mean, I totally get it. This is all relative in terms of cost, but they're relatively inexpensive for the quality. And um, I just happen to have a box of French clock movements here. I don't think we've ever talked about them on this group or not, um, but I thought we'd be just cool to like randomly pick out some French clock movements and have a look at those and talk through the different types, the kinds of challenges you're likely to face uh, when you uh, start repairing them, why you maybe should make them a second kind of phase of your learning, why maybe uh, a 30 hour sort of tall case clock movement might be a better bet. Um, just before we start delving into the French clocks, let's just go back to this um, 30 hour clock. And I can see the kind of scale of it compared to my hand, it's quite big. It's sort of twice as big as an Enfield clock. The beauty of these clocks is that they tend to be, I mean, they're beautifully made, more expensive. Um, and again, reasonably plentiful in Europe, but I get it that maybe not so much um, in the States and other countries but they're like really difficult to break because everything's bigger and stronger, um, which is good. The kind of downside to working on, on these clocks is that like all the ones we see here, they'll have already inevitably had a life as in they'll have been through the, um, the hands of many, many, many repairers and owners and so on. So you move from a state as a beginner where if you get into difficulties, you can, get another movement and maybe borrow an escape wheel, let's say, for instance, from a Smith Enfield clock and they might, uh, you know, exchange. That is never going to happen here. So if you run into difficulties, you're absolutely into the realm of making new uh, components. And um, these things, as you can see here, are almost as sort of organic as they are um, machine made. I mean, they're made in manufacturers but a massive amount of hand making them, no interchangeability uh, at all. You can't take a wheel, for instance, this wheel called the minute wheel here off another clock. The chance of that fitting is uh, effectively, um, effectively zero. Um, so yeah, they'll have always had some alterations, some lots of repairs, sorry. You can see here, this one has been dropped because the rivets uh, for the uh, pillars that are a bit broken and so on. So quite a gamble, I think, is what the, the kind of word I'm looking for, for the relative novice. You might hit lucky, you can just take one apart, put it back together, a bit of gentle washing and the thing is going to work okay. But you might also run into great difficulties. It drives you crazy and puts you off. Um, I suppose the good thing about buying from the internet, if you buy a clock that isn't restored, uh, that would be my advice, is that within reason, you can probably resell it and kind of maybe get your money back or something. Um, yeah. Derek says the pivots on French clocks are hardened and break easily. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, Thank you, Derek, for that. You're absolutely right. So the pros of working on a French clock is that if you've worked on a single train or two train Enfield clock, if you get a rack striking clock, we'll talk about what rack striking is in a minute, is that when you look at it, you're going to say, 
right, this is familiar territory. Um, I know what these components are cost. I know how they interact. Some uh, differences, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you'll kind of feel comfortable. Whereas with a tall case clock movement, um, then there's going to be quite a lot of difference there, I say. But as Derek absolutely says, and we'll pick out our first French clock, is that the wheels uh, they are significantly smaller, but also very fine compared to a mid 20th century mantle clock. So maybe, I mean, I know a lot of you people are in the States, maybe your advice would be to do these kind of um, European mantle clocks, then maybe an American uh, style design movement, because there are some quite uh, sort of uh, subtle differences there. If we just got a little French clock here that um, one of my customers actually uh, gave me to for Open Clock Club. And if we just, it was already in bits. If we look at the size of the escape wheel here, for instance, uh, let's just get that to focus. And the escape wheel from our Enfield clock, you can see that it's actually massively smaller in this case. There's a big difference in scale. And as Derek absolutely said, the steel that those um, Enfield clocks and things like that were made from typically wasn't hardened. Maybe the pallets were on some clocks, but the, um, the axles or the arbors here and the pivots uh, typically not hardened. And what that means is you get a little bit of kind of latitude if you happen to handle all the parts slightly clumsily whereas you don't with French clocks. The pivots here, and I'll just measure up this. Um, don't have my, um, don't have my caliper at hand, but yeah. So the pivot, that's the reduced diameter at the end of the arbor here, which you can barely see on the camera is half a millimeter. I repivoted some a couple of weeks ago that were 0.32 of a millimeter. So yeah, the, you've got to be really careful. But if you've been, if you worked your way through a couple of um, 20th century mantle clocks, then no reason why you wouldn't be able to tackle a French clock. Anyway, hopefully there's some um, activity in the chat about what next for beginners. Just, no. <laughs> no I'll, I'll write the question. All right, write the question. Good, good. It does beg, just beg me to ask what people are people asking me to do something that I'm not doing. Right. So here we go on our French clock adventure. So these clocks, um, this is a totally kind of so called random box of movements that we bought. Uh, one of my students and I, who I think actually is running this as a PhD type project now, bought um, a stock of. French clocks, about 50 of them, um, back in 2000 and I don't know, about 10 years ago anyway. And <laughs> yeah, it's an, another project on a long, long list. Um, and the, the clocks of those, most of those are now down in London, but I ended up with a box of these movements and there's all sorts of actually real cool stuff to look at here. So let's just, spend half an hour and look at some French clocks. Uh, so these clocks were um, the story of clock making in France and the story of clock making in England um, kind of run parallel. The, the French golden age was later than the, uh, the British or English golden age. Don't particularly like either of those uh, kind of expressions, but anyway. Um, and what seemed to happen at the middle of the 19th century was the French manufacturers gotten, unlike the English uh, manufacturers, they got together and they decided to make uh, a movement or a type of movement that was broadly universal. Now, this is an interesting kind of project, and this is what we were meant to be researching, because when you see these uh, movements, they typically, but not always, as you'll see in a, in a bit, have circular plates, all different sizes. And these movements went through stages of manufacture, a blanc roulant, so uh, a blank working 
movement or going movement, I suppose, was made by some people and then finished like by others. A bit like the system with a bush in watchmaking where a lot of watch manufacturers don't actually make the movement. They buy in part made up movements. But what seems crazy about this story is that um, you might look at three or four French clocks and we're going to see them in the next few uh, next few minutes and you think they look very similar they are not interchangeable parts this is kind of quite crazy really so that whole process of manufacturing is one that we are looking into so what do you get with your french clock well you get a very so these are typically made between about 1860 and they're actually making them up to the 1970s when i was in Retailing, we had a, a four glass French clock, which is brand new, made by Lepe. I think Madame Lepe was still on the go then. Maybe that was even in the 80s. Uh, I don't know whether they still make them or not. But um, so, but most of these are between the 1860s, 1870s, and the First World War. Uh, you, you'll see these, and typically in black um, slate type cases. So, this is the uh, mechanism. We'll see all sorts here. Um, like our Enfield clock, let's just zoom out a wee bit more. Like our Enfield clock, we've got a four pillar movement. Now, the big difference between, I won't bring it back onto stage, our 30 hour European long case clock, English long case clock, and a French clock is that on a French clock, typically the pillars are pinned, as you can see here, in the back plate. There's no notes holding this together. It's just uh, cross pinning, whereas an English clock tends to be pinned in the front plate. So that's the uh, the kind of um, broad difference there. But four pillar construction, like our Enfield clock, we've got two mainspring barrels, going barrels, um, one for the striking mechanism and one for the uh, going mechanism, one for the time. And uh, we've got two different types of striking mechanisms that we uh, see in these clocks. One, and I'll explain as we go through and we'll find some examples, is called rack striking, and one is called count wheel striking. Count wheel striking predates rack striking, but I think rack striking has been around since the 1670s, so it certainly is no new kid on the block. Now, last, well, in fact, today, we saw, you remember this? This device is a thing called the count wheel. It's often called the locking plate for some reason. I don't know why, because it doesn't have a locking function. And you can see it's got stations that relate to the number of blow struck. So uh, one o'clock is actually a gap, but two, three, four, five, and so on. Now, typical um, English long case clocks only strike the hours. They don't strike the half hours whereas these continental clocks and the Enfields strike both hours and a half hours. So whereas you've got 78 stations on that count wheel, on this one, and it looks slightly different, but it's got exactly the same function. It's got, uh, oh, I've got to press my button there. Well, the help things are not. It's got exactly the same function. It's got stations here for uh, two, three, four, five, and so on. But the notches, the gaps between the stations, like this one here, are in fact slightly longer because they have to accommodate the half hour. So um, here's a little thing to prevent you great math people from getting too bored. So if our, um, our striking clock's got 78 stations, how many stations are on this count wheel? So first one in the live chat, please, with that wins a special non-prize. Um, uh, what else have we got here? Okay, so we've got two trains, count wheel striking, the count wheel being on the back plate in this case. And this one is kind of quite unusual because when we turn it over, we can see the remains of the escapement, uh, which is mounted on the front plate. Now, normally the escapement is mounted between the plates and it's not visible when the clock is uh, clock is running. Uh, regrettably, the pallets and the hands are missing, but um, we see here the escape wheel. And this type of escapement is analogous to a deadbeat escapement, but it's not a deadbeat escapement. So when you hear people say that the Broco, as it's 
typically called escape and is deadbeat. It's not deadbeat. But anyway, um, we can get into that with a drawing at some other point. So this is kind of quite nice, but not the place to begin because this uh, escapement brings its own problems. Often the palette, um, the parts of the uh, mechanism that interact with the escape wheel, the pallets are jeweled, they're made out of cornelian or agate, and they get broken. And well, I won't get on my soapbox about replacing those, but there's all sorts of difficulties with not being able to get the same diameter as the uh, pallet that was there. And um, for top tips, I would always replace those with dead hard steel, because that's the only way you can really get the right uh, diameter. But anyway, lots of difficulties there um, with setting these things up potentially. Um, so interesting, but not the place to start. I wouldn't personally start with a visible escapement. Matthew, can you repeat that question, the one you said about the count wheel? Yeah, if, um, the question is, if uh, uh, our long case clock has uh, 78 stations on the count wheel, it strikes the hours on the hour. When you've got that, like a continental clock that strikes a half hours, how many stations are on your count wheel? That's the question. It's so what people, um, my math teacher used to call simple math until I realized that there wasn't uh, such a thing as simple math. So this is a complete uh, lucky dip because I haven't looked in this box for years and years and years. So it's good fun. Oh, this is kind of quite cool really because Wow, this is, um, it's amazing, isn't it? This is actually quite interesting uh, because this is an unusual dial and I'd be love to know what you people think, but if you look in the reflected light, I've just noticed that um, it's got a sort of engine turned rosette in the middle. You see that? You'll see engine turning, saw it on the last one. Uh, so rose engine work, or maybe it's stamped in this case, but in the center. But the dial has been overpainted. So I think underneath here is one of those gilt metal dials, but it's been beautifully done. So I wonder whether this is a factory um, sort of option that as Arabic numbers became more popular in the sort of 1920s, 1930s, um, and the factory maybe had a lot of stock of engine turn dials or stamped dials, they started painting some of them. The quality of the painting looks so nice. Um, it doesn't look like an aftermarket thing, but maybe maybe it is. It'd be interesting to investigate. I wouldn't think that anything unusual about this, other than the fact you very rarely see French clocks with painted dials like this. Enamel dials, yes, totally, but not painted dials. Is it enamel or is it painted? No, it's painted. How can you tell? Just by the soft kind of um, nature of it. You know, it's not got that glassy, uh, hard reflection of the of enamel. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right, Sam, is it Sam? Yeah, Sam. yeah, loads of enamel dials. I might find one in a minute as we dig into our collection. But uh, this kind of cream, um, I think it's painted. But uh, the thing that really uh, interests me, I'll get it back in the reflected light look, you can just see the engine turning under there. Is that crazy? Anyway. You've got some answers to your question about the count wheel. Right. Is it 84? No. Is it 96? No. Is it 90 plus? <laughs> 90 plus. It is kind of 90 plus. The answer is, if you add up one and two and three and four right through to 12, you get 78, don't you? It's 78. Ian says 78. Yeah, but with the question is, if you've got half hour striking as well, you've got another 12 blows, haven't you? So the answer is 90. 78 plus 12. Is that 90? Yeah, the answer is 90. Right, so let's just flip this over and have a look on the back. So we can see already we've got a smaller ebauche than the last one. Uh, there are probably five or six different diameter of plates here. Um, now on the on French clocks, you often see a kind of serial numbering system, which you can see here is repeated on the bezel, three, five, five, five in this case. And um, uh, and repeated on the back plate. So that's a nice way, if you're buying a French clock, to tell whether all the parts fit together. You normally get the number on the bezel, on the movement back plate. Just turn that off. Ian says French count wheel usually only goes back in one place, which is usually marked. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a really good point that the um, uh, we've been talking about this a bit on the Facebook group, that when you fit these clocks back together, the components are often marked. So a couple of top tips. Thank you, uh, Ian. That's a really good tip. So we've got our serial number and then you've got another number down here. I don't know if you can see it's five, two, five, two. And what that is, is that's the pendulum length in French, French inches. So I think that's avoir de poids inches, is it? I don't know. But anyway, so again, look for that number on the um, on the pendulum to check that the clock is kind of uh, all together. So Ian's point, really good point. There are a few kind of very common uh, issues when repairing these clocks. Bushing isn't one of them. They rarely need bushing. Um, uh, but the 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 places people get into difficulty is by replacing the springs. So I'd say always leave the main springs there if you think they're the original springs, if you can, if they're not broken, um, because it's easy to overdrive these clocks. Uh, you can see here, one of the most common repairs here is the fact that uh, the hammer shank and the hammer boss are soft soldered together. So when these are new, let's just get a bit more. So 70 plus 12. Yeah. 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 Uh, when these are new, you might not know, uh, or maybe you do, that the hammer shank is threaded. So clean the solder off. Uh, we've shown how to do this on the live stream. And you can re you can actually get these things back together, maybe as they were, maybe a bit of a stud lock. So that's one very common sort of problem that people go to adjust the hammer in relation to the gong. And then the whole thing sort of wears and it flops down. So they end up soldering it. So that's one interesting thing. Um, question here about the cleaning of this, that the back cock seems to have been cleaned in something and the movement doesn't. Um, but as Ian said, we'll go back, we'll find another count wheel striking one in a minute. The relationship between the count wheel and the square it fits on is set by the maker and there's a, a mark struck across the square. But also in setting up the uh, striking train, as we try and get some light in here. Right, so it'll go. Um, in setting up the striking train, there's an absolutely specific phase relationship between these wheels, and most of them are marked, and it's really easy to miss this, and I can go into this in more detail um in future if you want but in particular this wheel here we just saw the pinwheel from our 30 hour clock well this is the equivalent here that lifts the hammer you can just about see the pins that look sticking out the front and um i might actually be able to get it to strike or maybe not yeah there we are so um we just saw it strike and it's really important that the striking train locks immediately after the hammer has dropped, as it does here. And so you often find French clocks where it's uh, locked on lift, which is no good because the striking train will be reluctant to start. And the way that you get that phase relationship right is that this wheel is almost always marked with a dot mark. And this pinion here, the stop wheel pinion, one of the pinion leaves is normally filed away on its corner and you align uh, those two things. So top tip if you repair French clocks. You can also see here that this plate has got two points or bridges screwed on the back. So once the power's off the main springs, you can actually remove this one in particular um, and that allows you to get the pinwheel out um, independent of the train and you can move it round in relation to that pinion. I'm not sure that's why they're made like that, but because uh, that doesn't apply for the center wheel as well, but um, hey ho. So um, yeah, some top tips there for setting them up. Count wheel on its square, relationship between the pinwheel and the stop wheel pinion is uh, important. And it's almost always, but not absolutely always marked. So some cool stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. first multi train movement for America with the E. Ingram Time and Strike Capital Mantle Clock readily available, highly recommended. 
Great, great. So that's Ingram. Jonas says, um, try an Ingram as one of your first clocks after a, um, and I guess they make they made them in timepiece only as well. Um, I'm not sure we somebody in the Facebook group was talking about our next live stream clock, which again was a donation. That might be Ingram, is it? Um, can't remember. It was right. Okay, so thank you, Jonas, for that really useful uh, information. Ah, oh, this is cool. Gosh, it's like Christmas. Every one of these is um, interesting. Well, unlike Christmas, this is actually interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, because this is a timepiece. How cute is this? Um, so this has got an enamel dial. I will have to investigate the other one because I'm doubting myself now. Yeah, this has got an enamel dial. Um, minute hands missing. Uh, it's got regulation here. These French clocks have almost always got uh, a little square here at 12 at the top of the, um, in the sight ring to the bezel. And what that does is it connects via this arbor here to a mechanism at the top of the pendulum, plural suspension springs seen better days, uh, where you can actually adjust the uh, going of the clock, the rate of the clock, without fiddling with the bottom of the pendulum. If you imagine these clocks are often in big sort of heavy stone cases, you do not want to be lifting the case down or under a glass shade to get to the pendulum. So you set the pendulum something like, and then the owner or the winder can use a small key, a bit like a watch key on this square to regulate the clock as they go along. Uh, so this is called Broco. There are two or three different versions uh, of this kind of uh, mechanism. Well, this changes the effective length of the pendulum by drawing the suspension spring up through chops. You can still rate the pendulum down here, but um, that's done as a separate sort of process. So this is really cool, actually. Uh, you can see very much like our um, Enfield clock. We've got a barrel, intermediate wheel down there, center wheel, upper intermediate wheel, escape wheel and pallets. It's just kind of smaller. And as Dell absolutely said, totally right, the pivots are hard. So when you take one of these apart, you've got to be very careful that they don't get broken off because it's difficult to uh, glue them back on again. So this is a really cool place to start. And as I say, in England, at least, these clocks are still relatively inexpensive. This would, you know, restore really nicely, make a pendulum and uh, make a hand, two good exercises there, clean the thing up a little bit and away you go, got a good clock. The way that they're fitted into the case is via these straps. There's usually a bezel, a similar bezel to the front here on the back and they're fitted via these uh, straps here. Don't... Oh, this one's been in a wooden case. Look, it's got some eyes. There, I think that's what's happened. Yeah, that's what's happened. This has been fitted into a wooden case. You can see there part of the serial number stamped in the top of the bezel. And the escapement is not dissimilar to our Enfield escapement that we've talked about a lot on this channel, um, except it's a solid pallet frame, not the bent round type of uh, pallets. But um, yeah, that's really, uh, really quite nice, that little timepiece. Back into the lucky day. Ah, oh, this is quite cool. I can tell already without getting it out of the paper. Because um, not all French clocks have uh, got circular plates. This one here, which is really nice for a lot of reasons. It's got, lost my pointy stick, got square plates, as you can see. The same mechanism, it's got the two ponts. Uh, it's got the same pinwheel arrangement. Here, it's got a similar broker, but with a much bigger back cock, depending on the case. And then it's got the pendulum length there, look, 7.2 inches. Uh, but square plates, this is nice. I think, uh, is it Sam put a clock on Facebook group that had square plates? It was much posher than this. I think it had quad striking or something. But anyway, same kind of idea. So what do we got here? We, we saw one with count wheel striking, which is a sequential system with count wheel striking, um, which is not a better or worse system. Uh, one didn't get rid of the other, as is often the case with technologies, when a new technology comes along and you were, the old one doesn't just disappear because uh, there's a lot of advantages of count wheel striking. Um, and, uh, but this is different. This is rack striking and, the, uh, and it's named because of this component here, 
which is called let's just zoom in as much as we can ting tang yeah. right okay yeah so it's quarter striking on two gongs yeah yeah it would be a far superior clock of course uh you can see there's a little um spacing washer missing from this rack here which is a bit of a shame Ian said putting the fly back always needs great care as weight of fit can easily damage the bit yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, a few people now have mentioned the fact that the pivots in these clocks are fragile. That's not a reason not to work on them, but just be super careful because repivoting them is quite uh, tricky. So on the um, on the rack striking system here, that's quite nice to look at this. Uh, it's so this component has moved around. This is the support for that front uh, broker regulation arbor that we talked about been in that position for a long time um so the rack striking we've got a rack here and uh, we've got a thing called poor thing is understandably reluctant to actually work um we've got um a rack hook here so this component holds up the rack as the clock is gathering the rack in position and then where the rack interacts with the going side of the movement so the hands fit on here this is the wheel in which the hour hand fits the minute hand fits on that one underneath um, you can see this curved device here called the snail now the big difference and i won't go off and try and find one because i will disappear and not come back um between sort of european or english work like you'll see on the uh smith enfield clocks and this is that the smith enfield clock has got 12 uh, steps on here relating to the number of hours struck. Now, this has also got 12 steps on it, but you just can't see them because it's stepless, as in they're all sort of squidged into one continuous curve. Don't quite know why that uh, was done like that. It seems to be sort of asking for trouble, but it, of course, it gives you an infinite number of positions before you finally fix the snail with the screw. So, um, yeah, a relationship between the this, I don't know if you can see a little component here called the gathering pallet uh, is fitted through into the striking train. And then we've got, uh, as I said, the uh, number of hours, number of blows struck regulated by the position of the uh, stepless snail here, rack, rack hook and lifting piece. Yeah, the tolerances on these clocks are all much smaller, obviously, than they are on those, um, those mantle clocks. We can just about looking here and we can see buried inside there the lifting piece often a problem with that is it rubs uh, on one component anything else to note oh yeah something else to note here is that the, you'll notice that the let's just get the rack out of the way if we can um or maybe not uh, you'll notice that the top two um pivots on the uh, the one on the striking train here and the one on the going train here so this is the fly the one that ian just re referred to and the pallet arbor here are mounted in little sort of separate uh, bearing pieces and they are uh, eccentrics so the pivot you can just about see there um you know the camera will focus on our the pivot is mounted off the center so in theory you can change the depthing um of those mobiles what is depthing just happened to have written the kind of book on it which is available on kindle did i mention it uh anyway but the golden rule here is do not change this depth thing unless you've got a good reason to do that in fact what i would say is that uh, actually when you clean you can clean this component the bearing hole the working surface and leave it in the plate. These are not, um, these separate bearing pieces are not screwed in. They're just pushed in on a taper, which is perfectly fine. It's a really good way of doing it. But what you'll find is if you look at your clock you're repairing and these little, uh, sometimes it's a slot, sometimes like this, uh, it's this kind of sticking out D section piece. Sometimes the clocks have got both of those. Um, if you see that they've been chewed up with end cutters or pliers or something, then a little warning bell and flashing red light is going to start in your mind because you're going to be interested in looking at the depth thing of the escapement 
another fly to the warning wheel. And uh, so my advice is leave them well alone unless you think that they've been fiddled with, uh, fiddled with before. I think they're basically set in the factory and that's it. Obviously the warning wheel eventually will wear to the degree that you could close up the center distance but um, I don't think it's one of those uh, factory, um, I don't think it's a user adjustable, it's like that thing on the back of your television that says, do not remove this cover unless you're a qualified electrician uh, personnel. I always remove that cover, of course, and start fiddling about in the back. Um, but I, I don't recommend it on televisions, especially, but on French clocks either. Leave those bearings um, well alone. Yeah, you can just see here, there's a separate uh, domed washer or collet spacing piece, which is uh, missing from there. Okay, so there's one with a square movement. See what else we've got in this great bundle of joy. Hi. Some said his clock had several marks for various different positions, but none of them actually worked. Right, okay, yeah, they're often marked at the factory with a little dimple. But um, yeah, if it's been moved a lot, then uh, th then you have to obviously figure out the depth thing. Probably not a lot to see here. We've got that count wheel, and as Ian quite rightly said, on one of these squares is a file mark that relates to a file mark on the back of the collet, and you should align those when fitting them together. Um, what else have we got? Again, no hands. I think the hands have been stolen off these clocks because people have needed French clock hands. When you set the um, the friction, ah, right. The reason that minute hands are often broken on French clocks goes back to that. Um, I think we talked about this before, haven't we? Goes back to this stepless snail arrangement here on uh, our Enfield clock on the rack. This is the rack. Um, this is the rack arm. Uh, the rack. This doesn't have a rack tail. The rack tail would stick out here with a spring on it. No rack spring. Just garden gravity that uh, controls this. But when the uh, this wheel rotates to the degree that this radial face here can sometimes butt against the the nose of the rack arm, when it's made new, this has got such a small angle on it. It's meant to flip up out of the way but the reality is as soon as the oil gets a bit sticky it sticks in place and um and uh, what happens is the clock stops about 20 past midday uh and the understandably the owner thinks oh, i'll just move the hand on rewind the clock and unless the striking train runs and gathers the hand gets broken off so that's why you see so many uh repairs on um french clocks Oh, two minutes left. So many French clocks to look at. Uh, oh, this is quite cool. A bit different. This is a slightly later one. Rack striking clock. And it's got a slate dial. So this, again, minute hand missing. The dial is actually engraved stone. Really smart. How handsome is that? With an um, electro gilt hand as well. Really, really nice. And not Armelou, these movements. Ormolu is uh, mercury fire gilded bronze, and that relates to 18th century and early 19th century French clocks. These are electro gilt. So this is a development of the movement. You can see a change here to the bezel. They put these uh, sort of lugs on, and also they've kept the same barrel depth, but have this kind of step frame. Uh, they, I think they call it double frame in turret clocks. So shorter arbors here which presumably makes manufacturing a bit easy. Is that saving on materials? Uh, I don't know why they do that, but um, this is a later kind of um, development and a slightly different uh, kind of um, uh, Broco type suspension adjustment here where the um, mechanism is uh, all contained within two sort of uh, split blocks there. So slightly different again on Facebook, it was Ian with his um, book that he showed us uh, about the kind of three different uh, mechanisms there. One more before we have to say goodbye. How to make the hands? Yeah. Right, okay. Making hands. Good. Write it down so I don't forget. I think that was a 20, uh, sort of uh, 1920s, 1930s 
one, although it has got the black dial. So good question. Um, I would cer say certainly 20th century. Um, it's got sort of later, look at the serial number, the way it's stamped on as well. It's not quite as nice. And look at the front plate on the inside. Actually, really amazing finishing. I love this kind of finishing, uh, but not quite as sort of nice, nicely finished as the other one. So I would say uh, into the 20th century. So last one, and this might not have much to say about this. Again, this idea that these things are, when I first started in clock making, people said, oh, don't like these clocks because they're all the same. They are certainly not all the same. This one, unfortunately, has been cleaned in something that's kind of etched the surface. It's sort of all feels a bit dry and so on. Anyway, so timepiece, uh, you can see that the clocks have got what, uh, what we might call a false plate. So they've got a, a, a secondary plate between the front plate at the moment and the dial plate, um, different, sort of a serial uh, number stamp. So again, a bit later maybe. Yeah, nice. Every one of these is really beautifully made and very sweet. And this one's got this nice uh, sunk dial center, electro gilt again with um, both hands in place and a nice enameled um, chapter ring, which has got a bit of a chip out of it there. So um, there we go. Uh, that maybe kind of concludes for today because we're out of time. So little route through the French clock box. I've got about another 20 to go if we ever want to have another um, looking at French clock movement session. Uh, so yeah, thinking about where you go once you've actually gotten off the starting line, which is what we're all about. Um, hopefully that's helpful. If you do want to get into French clocks and you're still nervous or there's some detail that you want to know, either contact us through the Facebook group or send a request to us to talk about X, Y or Z on this group, on this uh, um, Open Clock Club. And we will do. And we're happy to go back to the end fields, of course, as well. Lots, lots to say about those yet. So um, making hands. Yeah, I mean, I probably you people know much more about than I do, but I'm happy to tell you of my experiences and um, how I would go about doing that. In fact, our live stream clock, the tall case clock needs two hands. So I'll be uh, doing that in a couple of months time. Anyway, uh, thanks to uh, Team Open Clock Club as always. Thank you to you all for turning up and joining in the live chat. Enjoy the weekend. And uh, maybe not next week, depends how things go with um, our internet auction site, but uh, we will slowly urge towards looking at a couple of busy clock movements as well. And that issue, that sort of um, a difficult issue of mainspring replacement. So keep in touch, keep going on the Facebook. Thank you to our regulars there. Great to see you all. And we will see you next week, same time, same place. And don't forget to go straight to Amazon now and buy our new uh, depth thing and bushing uh, book thing publication, which is highly controversial, of course. So as always, thanks very much and bye for now.